Nicole, ich weiß nicht, wann wir uns kennengelernt haben, in den 70er oder 80er oder 90er Jahren. Es gab jedenfalls immer entwicklungspolitische Debatten, die davon ausgingen, dass man ein nachholendes Wachstum organisieren müsse. In den 80ern gab es eine große Debatte von der Weltbank forciert zu Strukturanpassungsmaßnahmen. Wenn wir diese Maßnahmen umsetzen, würde auch die südliche Welt den Stand der Industrieländer erhalten. Es begannen dann Diskussionen über die Auswirkungen. Danach gab es eine große Schuldendebatte. Und ich denke, du wirst uns etwas erzählen, wo wir heute stehen, was daraus geworden ist und vielleicht auch, welche Alternativen es gibt. Bevor du, dich, bevor du einsteigst, stell dich bitte noch einmal kurz vor und deinen Arbeitszusammenhang. Uh, thanks, Wilfried. I hope we don't go back to the 70s. God, that would really, I, I, well, maybe even a little bit later. Don't let the grey hair confuse you, okay? Um, <laughs> um, okay, my name's Nicola uh, Bullard from an organisation called Focus on the Global South, which is a uh, activist research um, NGO Based, uh, based in South and Southeast Asia. We work in, mainly in India, uh, the Philippines and Thailand. Um, and in our work, we try to uh, work with social movements uh, to support their struggles, to do research um, and policy work, which can help uh, in the movements of, of struggle and resistance. Uh, we're working to uh, articulate and visibilize Uh, alternatives that come from from the ground and we also work to <coughs> articulate the linkages excuse me a sec <coughs> uh, the links between what's happening at the at the base and what's happening on the ground and that relationship with international institutions international policies and international processes so making that that macro micro linkage in both directions um, at present, uh, well, for the, for the past uh, 15 years or so, uh, FOCUS has been very active in the um, anti-globalisation slash global justice movement, uh, particularly in our uh, critique and analysis of the, um, the big institutions, the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and looking at the impact that the policies of these institutions are having on the ground, uh, in the South in particular. Uh, and <clears throat> as Wilfried uh, mentioned in the, the short introduction, um, I'm, I actually thought it would be useful to, to just go back a little bit in history to remember where this um, uh, growth-based uh, development model came from, because in fact the only development, if in, in quotation marks, the only development model uh, that is, um, uh, uh, is on the table at the moment is a development model based on growth. Uh, and it's the idea that, that poor countries, periphery countries can, you know, lift themselves out of poverty by completely restructuring their economies so that they become competitive uh, in the global trading system, that they become attractive locations for foreign investment uh, and that they can become part of the, the global uh, production system. So I think it's, it's useful uh, just to remember, to you know, remind ourselves a little bit where, where this has come from, uh, whose interests it serves uh, and what has been the impact. Um, and forgive me if this is a little bit like, you know, 101 of development studies or something, but it, it's perhaps just worth recapping. Um, of course, we can, I mean, you only need to read uh, Rosa Luxemburg to have a very good analysis of the, uh, the, the behaviour of the imperialist countries in expanding their, their realm of influence to extract resources and wealth from the periphery. Um, but uh, in the period when, when Luxembourg was writing, the, the rich countries at the centre 
had no intention to develop the South. They were not interested in, in developing the South. As far as they were concerned, the South was, they, was barbaric and, and other and really not uh, uh, only, only suitable as a place for exploitation. Uh, not as as uh, as societies that needed to be respected or developed or modernised, and this idea of of modernisation of the South uh, only really started to to get some traction um, in the 1950s, uh, when the uh, particularly with the the post-colonial movement and the independence movements, uh, many countries of the South. Uh, adopted uh, policies which were aimed towards modernization, progress um, and industrialization. So there was a kind of developmentalism uh, which was dominant in the thinking of the newly uh, independent countries in, in Latin America and Africa and, in, and Asia, uh, which led them uh, to adopt a path of industrialization, uh, often based on what was called an import substitution model, which is the idea that there would be a kind of endogenous uh, development, that development would take place within the country uh, and that the, the country would in fact produce internally uh, all of the, the industrial uh, goods and, and capital uh, equipment that was needed for uh, its process of industrialization, rather than being dependent uh, on uh, importing these capital goods from outside. So there was a, a model of development which was very much based on local production, local industrialization, and a kind of nationalistic uh, project. Uh, this was very much the thinking in, in the 50s and the 60s. But if we, we just, and, and, and to, in many respects, this was a, a quite successful model if you measure it in terms of, of growth uh, and expansion of employment in the industrial sector, at least for some countries, okay? Uh, and of course, it's a very patchy record. Uh, what, uh, and if we fast forward a little bit through to the, the 70s with the huge, um, uh, boom and big increase in the price of oil, uh, what happened, of course, then was that many countries, uh, rather than uh, accessing uh, capital for investments uh, through uh, you know, accum local accumulation, they were able to borrow very cheap money from the oil-producing countries. Uh, and this, through uh, a, a set of, you know, a, international economic um, dynamics that I won't explain now, and I hope I could explain them if someone asked me, but that, that in fact that the price of money became very expensive. These countries ended up in uh, a lot of debt. Um, and at that point, um, that's where institutions such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund became very important because they had access to uh, money which they could then lend to these countries to help them with their debt problems. And I think that it was at this point that this whole concept of growth as the main development objective uh, became so dominant uh, in, in the South. Uh, because with the arrival of the International Monetary Fund, uh, many countries were uh, required to adopt a set of economic policies which is known as stru structural adjustment programs. And many these policies were by and large designed to um, liberalise, to open up the, the um, economies of these uh, countries uh, to the rest of the world. Now, the motivation behind this was very much coming from the rich, in country, rich industrialized countries of the center who actually needed to expand their own market because their own growth had reached a kind of a limit. And so they needed to get out of this stagnation by expanding their own markets, uh, expanding the possibilities for exporting to other countries, expanding the resource base that they had access to and expanding the pool of low-cost labour, which would help uh, 
uh, corporations to be competitive uh, in, their, in their production costs. So this was, I think, the, the precursor of the period of globalization. It actually established the conditions uh, which allowed many countries in the South to be very quickly uh, integrated into a global trade and financial system because the structural adjustment programs actually destroyed many of the economic policies that had been put in place to protect uh, certain economic sectors, to give subsidies to uh, local agricultural production, to give subsidies to local industrial manufacturing and so on. All of these subsidies, all of these incentives, all of these uh, uh, policies that had been put in place to foster national economic development were very quickly swept aside by the structural adjustment programs. And rather than sort of national development um, being the, 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 the paradigm, uh, growth very quickly became the development paradigm. And this is growth based on exports. And the idea was that countries would develop either extractive or, or manufacturing sectors or agricultural sectors that would be competitive in the global system and they would be able to, to generate uh, foreign exchange earnings and therefore accumulate domestic capital um, by being part of this global trading system and exporting, um, uh, exporting to the rest of the world. Um, but always the cards were very much stacked against uh, the developing countries. Uh, and we can see many examples of countries that have been um, through uh, different um, uh, barriers that have been put in place from the north or even more recently by the, the, the rules of the World Trade Organization. Many countries have been trapped at a certain uh, point of, if you like, economic development where they're still stuck in this um, uh, economic, um, uh, what do you call it? I can't think of the word. I'll just restart the sentence. They're, they're still absolutely dependent on exporting uh, their primary uh, produce by exporting their, uh, their forests, by exporting uh, unprocessed agricultural products and minerals. And so the, 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 the wealth of the country is very much dependent on actually selling uh, the, the, the real wealth of the country, uh, including the cheap labour. Um, I think the, the promise of growth um, was uh, always a very attractive um, option for the political elites in many countries um, because it was a kind of, uh, in, in many respects, it was sort of an easy way out um, because it, it, it sort of got them off the hook of having to put in place any kind of real uh, uh, social security systems, any proper taxation systems, because so long as they could have a, a constant stream of foreign investment, uh, foreign direct investment or even speculative investment, it meant that governments always had the cash uh, to to invest in, in different projects um, and to, to keep the local capitalist class, you know, they, they also had access to cash. And so there was no real kind of um, structural change in the societies. So I think this is an important, this is a, a gross generalisation, but just let me make a sort of a caricature of a difference. Um, in, in Europe, where many countries have through the principally through the struggles of the trade unions been able to establish very solid um, social contracts, social security sy systems, social welfare systems, labor protection, minimum wages, and so on, public health systems. All of those things have been put in place. And the kind of struggles that are taking place, uh, particularly in Europe, are by and large to defend those gains which have been made in the past. They're not always successful struggles, of course, but by and large, a lot of it is about defending social gains that have been made in the past. In contrast, um, in, the, in the developing countries, 
most countries never had the opportunity to put in place these kind of social protection mechanisms. So the, the transition from being largely agrarian, agricultural, peasant-based societies to being uh, industrial manufacturers for uh, the global production chain happened without any kind of social protection, without any kind of uh, measures which would actually buffer um, the impacts of that, that very dramatic transition. So the consequence is that, that the majority of um, workers um, who are presently uh, working in factories in the Global South or toiling in the fields of the Global South have absolutely no social protection. And these are the, the groups of people who are completely invisible, um, have no uh, organisations to speak for them and are very much, I would say, the victims of this economic growth development model. Um, there has been almost no benefit to this underclass of people in most countries in the Global South. Uh, there has, on the other hand though, um, been a real benefit to uh, the elites in these countries and there has been a growing um, uh, middle class. Okay, So in, in many countries in the Global South, and of course the, the cliche that the, the press always churns out is the, the size of the middle class in, in China and India, uh, which actually eclipses the total population of Europe. Um, but relative to the actual size of the population, these middle classes are still quite small. And so the, 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 the challenge that, that is facing many countries in the South is that you have, on the one hand, um, the majority of the population which has not benefited from uh, this economic model, model based on growth. Um, they have actually lost a lot of assets that they previously had, like land or access to resources or the kind of nature, uh, live, the, uh, a livelihood that was somehow embedded in nature. Uh, much of this has been either privatised or turned into industrial zones or turned into indi um, agro-industry which is exported to the rest of the world. So the level of precarity um, is extremely high in, in many countries, in many sectors in the South because they've essentially been stripped of many of the resources which would give some kind of, of security and there is no social security system to replace it. But as I said, there is an emerging middle class which has a real stake in this system. They're very invested uh, in the, the benefits of, uh, of this uh, modernization uh, and being part of, of, of a global economy. Uh, and so any kind of um, challenge to this, uh, this economic development model um, is essentially going to be a kind of a class based challenge because there is a real conflict of interests between the, the, um, the working class, the peasants, the, the, um, uh, the unorganised and precarious sectors in the south and the middle classes who are very vested in the current development model and who so far up until now have been able to reap the benefits of the system without, having suff without suffering the consequences. Just to, to conclude, because this watch is being waved under my nose, uh, which means I have to finish, right? Yeah. Um, uh, I think the, the environmental questions are a very important um, entry point to see where, they, where there might be some, uh, at least possibility for discussion between, between the different uh, sectors, the, the different social sectors. Uh, because I lived for, for many years in, in Bangkok and I'm sure many of you have been there and you only need to spend, you know, half a day in Bangkok to know that the, the environmental um, uh, impact of, the, uh, of the, uh, the sort of incredible urbanisation and industrialisation is very hard. I mean, there's very high levels of pollution, very high levels of traffic congestion, uh, water quality is poor, etc., etc. And these things, uh, uh, well, 
they affect the middle class, but only up to a point, because of course the middle class are driving in private air conditioned cars. The middle class has uh, water filters, air conditioners and refrigerators, so they're able to actually sort of uh, buffer themselves from the, from the real impact of these, um, of the environmental degradation all around them. Uh, I think that um, there is, uh, just, just want to, to conclude, I think that the, it, it's sort of an open question uh, whether we can have a new model of growth. Um, clearly the, the current model of growth that has been um, imposed uh, on many countries in the South and I will add accepted by certain sectors who have benefited from that growth model, um, <clears throat> that, that is a failed model. It clearly has reached ecological and social limits. But the, the social sectors who are bearing the brunt of these impacts are not sufficiently empowered. They don't have the social power to actually engage in the, the struggles that need to be undertaken to shift to a new development model because they're simply not important in the political landscape as it is at the moment in many countries. Um, again, just to revert back to Thailand, many of you will have read about the, the struggles between the red and the yellows. I mean, in many respects, the reds represent the underclass of people who've been the victims of this development model, whereas the yellows represent the middle class who've been the beneficiaries of this development model. And it's really a, 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 a battle that has no clear um, uh, conclusion because the interests are so... Uh, deeply entrenched and they are so contradictory, the interests between these groups. And I think Thailand is not an exception. I think this is a reality in many countries. Um, so whether we can have a new uh, model of growth and what needs to grow and who benefits from that growth, we can leave to the next round.